So I have a little bit of bad news. Uh, tonight, everything I'm going to tell you about my work is a lie. And that's because, yes, it's, it's going to be lots of coherent stories. They're going to they're wrap up nicely. You're going to see a sort of problem that gets solved. And actually, that's totally not at all how, at least, my experience of creativity is. Right? Creativity, at least, uh, in the ways that I go through it, is it's, it's really messy and kind of destructive. It's super exciting. It's exhilarating. Uh, and there's this sort of core of fear in the midst of all of this uh, beauty that you're exploring. I mean, in a way, it really is, you know, like falling in love, right? And in the ways that I think about it, well, we'll take a second, and everybody just go ahead and close their eyes. Just close your eyes and actually take a moment to put yourself back in a time when you were falling in love. And that could be fifth grade, that could be ninth grade, twelfth grade. Could have been last night, we could see like a big baby boomlet of data viz children in the future. It would be very exciting. Yes, yes, it might have happened. It might have happened. Yes, yes, yes. No, but seriously, and, and think, about, think about those emotions that, that go through your experience the, the excitement, the exhilaration, and the, the fear, also the danger. And, and when I think about it, I think about it because there's this incredible sense of potential, of discovery, and there's this urge to discover the other side, right? And so when I think about it, and you can open your eyes now, uh, I think about images like this. This is uh, on target, this is Venus passing before the sun. Uh, but what it makes me think about in terms of discovery, this picture was taken 23,000 miles above Earth, beamed down to 30 people inside my studio who were busily sharing it and commenting, and then reached me when I was six miles above Earth flying here. Right, and that's, that's something really new. That's something that hasn't been done before. And I think that speaks a lot about where we are right now. There's a lot of things that are new, that are, are constantly crashing over us day after day, week after week, right? I, these I just randomly picked out of different uh, blogs and posts and things that people are sharing back and forth. And, and it feels to me uh, intuitively like we're entering into a new era. And I, I think of it like the era of discovery. Right, you think about the terra incognita that people were transversing centuries ago, and that idea that there was just this wild terrain out there, and of course, now we know so much about our physical terrain, and yet for me, I think about it in terms of this, this way of discovering this endless crashing uh, cycles of innovation. I, I started seeing this quote, and I saw uh, literally five different scientists say pretty much the exact same thing uh, on this. They talked about when you discover something in the lab, you know that for that moment, you're the only person in the world who knows that piece of information, right? I mean, there's a lot of really cool, exciting ways that creativity works, and people are talking about everything's a remix and about memes that are transferring one to the next, but uh, there's the other side of it, which is that history's linear discoveries are linear, and for us, actually, we have the chance to do exactly this within our work. We get a chance to be the first person discovered to do X to do Y. And that's a little bit about what the talk is going to be about tonight. It's, it's going to be uh, just four simple love stories. You know, last year I showed StoryCorps uh, and Changed by Us, as well as all the work that we're doing for the 9-11 memorial. Uh, and this year I'm going to talk all in new work, uh, but our, our theme is really about uh, learning, and specifically learning through experience. Uh, a lot of our work these days is, is interested in taking uh, information, and now that information is no longer uh, inaccessible, now that it's ubiquitous, trying to turn it into something that we can really tap into in a variety of ways. Uh, and I'm going to work uh, sort of forwards to backwards from the, the most finished work, and I'm going to try and get to some of the core creative ideas by showing uh, a, a crazy deck of pitched ideas that went nowhere, but that I want to share with you all. So the first one I'm going to show uh, is about creating human contact. We made this with Big, Garke Ingalls Group. Uh, this was the original rendering, and Times Square was made for Valentine's Day. Um, and it really is about popular culture and about putting this, this symbol inside of Times Square itself. It was these uh, transparent tubes that had these lighting instruments inside of it. It was a really beautiful design. And we ended up coming in and suggesting this idea uh, that you could actually touch this heart, and the actual cube itself would beat. Uh, in line with your actual heart rate itself. And the more people that chained on, 
uh, you can see here the interface, the more people actually, the, the faster it would beat. Right? So he says, more people, more love. It was a simple Arduino uh, microcontroller that was just connected. It was sending out pulses, and it would take longer the more people that were chained together. Uh, one thing that we discovered here uh, that I think is super interesting is, is actually making work in such an icon of popular culture. I'm going to show uh, this quick video, and you'll get a sense of what happens when you try and build on this scale, this big. This is actually uh, uh, some interpretation from this the This giant part in the heart of New York City appears to be able to measure the pulse of love. This thing is awesome. Wow! We're, we're making this light up. Touch it, and it flickers. Touch it with someone you love, it flares. It says more people, more love. Do you guys? We feel love. Look at that. It gets better, wait. No, wait. no, 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 it gets better, wait, wait. No, 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 check this out. Yeah, that's right, dogs. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's how hard we're working. Dogs are using our work now. Yes, that's right. acrylic cube made up of hundreds of LED tubes. So this is a public art project. Really taught us about the idea that the broader you go with your work, uh, you know, the simpler it needs to be, and then the capacity for so many different people to use it, to tap into it, is actually kind of incredible. And also the idea that appealing to emotions can actually build it that big. That the interaction itself doesn't need to be super complicated in order to make that human moment and in order for it to be satisfying. And that, that is actually a pretty hard thing, I think, for all of us to learn, because there's so many incredible, new, complicated things that you can do. So the second thing I'm going to show uh, taught us this, this idea that people can sometimes be more interesting than technology. I know, I know. I thought that might be controversial in this crowd. I know, it's hard to believe. Uh, but when you actually really consider it, technology, I think, a lot of times can stand in for the other people on the other side that you're really trying to communicate with, that you're trying to connect with. This is a project for the BMW Guggenheim Lab. It opened in New York City, and it's traveling around the world to nine different world cities. And interestingly enough, it's not really a museum. It's, it's a space for conversation, for workshops. We were asked to make a game that would help people understand the city of the future. That was the entire brief itself. And if you know anything about science fiction and the sort of city of the future, it can look like this in a utopian way, or dystopian, right? Or it can even be green. Uh, but actually, all of these images are totally false, right? The city of the future is essentially this city, Minneapolis, or this city, Beijing, or this city, Sao Paulo, with some other new stuff fit into it. Right? And how does that new stuff get there? Well, it gets there through lots of deliberation. And whether that's first world or developing world, there's always going to be a ton of different committees and conversations that are going to go into building the city of the future. So we essentially made a game about that. This is a game called Urbanology. And the way that it works is people get to choose these different tokens. It's made for families, for people of all ages to play it together. And once you pick a token based on these five different ways in which uh, you can measure a city, you take your place and then you argue your convictions. Right? So you're there basically to work and to convince other people who are playing the game that your point of view is the right one. And that's essentially modeling how cities actually really work. So it's all scenario-based. This question is, uh, would you impose a $5 toll on cars entering downtown, but there are questions about prostitution and pornography, about legislation and taxes. I actually had the, the great privilege of running the opening day, right? And it was hilarious, because essentially what you're doing is trying to instigate fights between people at the museum itself, right? And on the opening day, there was half New Yorkers and half Germans. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I mean, we had just the most incredible conversations, because the Germans you know, not to be stereotypical, but, you know, they have, like, really firm convictions, and, of course, New Yorkers do as well. A lot of the questions were about sustainability, and so there was one question, and, of course, there I'm, like, just trying to provoke everybody. I see someone shaking their head, I'm like, oh, I need to talk to you. And one woman was going on and on about, uh, there's a question about whether or not we should impose a service road in the middle of a park, and all the Germans were like, no, it's a terrible idea, you know, sustainability, green first. And one woman was like, excuse me, excuse me, give me, give me that microphone. She was like, I want to tell you something, okay? If you get in an accident, you do not want to be thrown in the back of a bicycle to go to the hospital, okay? <laughs> then you can see everyone like, oh, they put down, they change their votes. <laughs> That's like amazing, right? And so this way to essentially model the ways that cities actually work uh, was actually an incredibly effective way to teach people about cities themselves, right? And not surprisingly, you have all this cool technology that's basically gathering all these different results themselves. 
and then people would move the tokens forward and backwards. And then at the end of running eight different rounds of these different scenarios, you essentially have a data set that's been built by the people who played the game itself. And you can analyze that data set, right? So this is the overall priorities of that group of people. And then that is then compared against a data set that was prepared by the OECD, about 20 global cities. So it basically matched the city that people had made with different types of global cities and was able to demonstrate that back to people themselves. Right? And so it also makes this point that essentially the city of the future is kind of already out there. And certainly if you know about what's happening in China or the Middle East, it's being built as we speak. Right? And so this is basically connecting people with that idea. It's just the beginning of an experience with cities, and then it ends with a slide like this. Right? It talks about how your city may be the future of all cities, and it points you towards the rest of the lab, which has all these different workshops back and forth. So the third thing I'm going to show, it's a little bit longer, and this has been a really deep engagement for us, it's all about love at first sight. Uh, and this is a big engagement we're doing for the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, it opens 12, 12, 12, it's very exciting. Uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, if you don't know, is one of the nation's great institutions. Uh, when museum folks talk about art museums, they talk about the Met, talk about MoMA, talk about Cleveland, and it really is about the collection, it's about the architecture, it's about this venerable institution that has built up just an incredible history and collection to match. And so when they came to us, we were actually quite surprised uh, because you wouldn't think of a place like Cleveland investing so heavily in a new visitor experience. It's very, very conservative, as you can imagine. Uh, and you don't really think of a place like that as saying, yeah, we want something that's cutting edge and new. But they had a, a visionary set of donors and the board uh, was on top of it. But the problem was uh, they had an exhibition designer who had developed an exhibit model. Right? And if you know anything about exhibits, uh, and this is one of the galleries that they developed. So I'll just uh, decode this. The things around the perimeter, those are monitors. Those are, are monitors between you and the art. Right? And then in the center, there's one of those, uh, those smart tables. Right? So just to think about it, right? you're there in an art museum to look at the art, and there's a big railing in front of it with a monitor. Right? And the monitor, what's the monitor doing there? I guess it's there to give you information as if that would be helpful to understand the art deeper or in a more significant way. Uh, and when you think about it, between this and the smart table, right, where people are sort of flinging different images of, of these priceless, incredible works of art, like their little digital air hockey pucks back and forth between them, right? <laughs> like, well, what is this telling people about art? And beyond the fact that you have a smart table in the middle of the gallery, everyone's like this. Like, this is what we should be doing at art museums? So the first thing that we started thinking of was, instead of trying to solve an access to information problem, which I think is what happened previously, we really started thinking about how to augment a classic experience of art, which is the primary relationship where you're actually looking and experiencing the art, and to actually make it more significant, make it more relevant, more, make it more meaningful. So the first thing that we did was we uh, pulled all of the interfaces into the center of the gallery and made them all opt-in. So I'm going to show four different types of interfaces, but this is one of the main ones. And to make it contingent on these gatherings of artworks themselves. We, we started working uh, with sort of uh, short slogans, I guess you'd call them, sort of guiding principles. I always used to make fun of uh, firms that would do this, that would have these sort of brand guidelines. Uh, but it's actually really helpful, and it's really helpful in long projects, because you forget and you need something to send to yourself. This was one that we pulled out. Uh, they say, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. This is from Confucius, right? 551 BC. And what we started doing was essentially looking to the principles that the curators were trying to explain, because curators are there to talk to you and to tell you what's important, and that, that is important, but to try and figure out how to make ideas like this, like representation, into experiences, into something that you don't need to tell somebody. You can let them experience it, and then they will understand. They'll be able to synthesize it for themselves. So we started talking about representation. We had these long uh, philosophical conversations. First thing that I started getting interested in was uh, Tufti's idea of small multiples. Right? So this is like classic InfoViz, where you take lots of similar things and you place them next to each other in a way to really highlight the differences between them. And so the, the thing that I pitched them on, I said, you know, what if we had 10 art objects that all represented the same thing, all in a grouping together? Right? Because then that really highlights the idea like, oh, these 10 things are supposed to represent the same thing, but they all look radically different? And what is that about? Like, why are they, they, why are we 
making these art objects that look so different, but they're representing the same thing. So they came back with this idea of lions, and all of our interfaces in, in the center have these central questions. So you can see here, there's like pieces from the 19th century, pieces from Central Africa, pieces from Holland in the 17th century, ancient Roman artifacts, all are lions. They all are lions, right? And so that bags this question, you know, what does a lion look like? And so this is an interface that we uh, developed. Uh, it's just in, in wireframe format. I'll show you some finished work in a sec. But these themes, right, violence, royalty, strength. And when it goes into the actual sequence itself, it has a little opening, it's talking about making understanding artists like speaking and reading a visual language. All these lines are li all these the are lines, but they're very different. And so very simple question, right? What do you think the artist is trying to communicate? So let's start with a simple question. Which looks the most realistic? Right? And so if you might choose this one, it shows other people who have been voting on that. And then it asks this question. Well, just take a second. Which word best describes a line? And so you might choose noble. It shows you the other people. And then what it does is it asks you which object best represents noble. So if you choose this one, that's instantly this question, right? Like, what, what is really happening here? Because if you think that's the most realistic line, but that's the thing that best represents the word that represents the line, that's basically getting you to this idea that, yes, artwork is a language that plays between realism and symbolism. It's a very simple way. And then it builds it out from here and essentially shows you all of the other experiences that other visitors had. And I think about this as crowdsourcing interpretation and also really getting visitors to think about perception, right? Because if you just say to a visitor, well, composition does this to you or symbolism does that to you, well, you know, we're just taking your word for it. But you just showed me what these different things represent symbolically because people said what they represented. I think that's really kind of amazing that in this case, you wouldn't actually have to take a curator's word for it. You'd actually experience it with all the other visitors themselves. It gives them a very active a place. And then, of course, you can go from here and you can actually learn more about the artworks themselves. So that information layer is still there, but it really moves through the active interpretation. This is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, we had conversation after conversation about the human face because there's a whole group uh, that deals with just the human form. I kept saying, you know, what's so amazing is that you're in front of an ancient Greek statue, and that ancient Greek statue is a human being, the same way that you are. It's something that you totally take for granted, but that it's really hard to get people to plug into when they're in a museum, because they take everything for granted. Well, I'm here in a museum. Of course, there would be a statue of a person, but that statue is over, over 2,000 years old. It's based on the exact same proportions as your own body. Right? So we made up with this interface. Uh, which essentially has this sort of intro, and it talks about uh, this idea about how even though styles are changing back and forth, the capacity for human expression, and really for empathy, because you know, these types of figurative statues are plugging into deep, deep parts within our brain to create energy, empathy and projection. So you had this crazy idea to essentially use facial recognition to allow people to browse the archive, right? <laughs> and so it creates this very direct relationship. Very exciting. And so that's something that you can experience. No one needs to tell you that. You can actually be inside of that moment and experience that humanity. Similarly, for sculptural posing, I mean, if you, you talk to curators, they're all about uh, the p capacity to actually understand the artwork within the human form itself. Uh, so we started, obviously, looking at the Microsoft Connect and thinking about people making their own sculptures themselves. Uh, and so this is a piece that allows you essentially to browse and to recreate the objects that are directly in front of you. It makes it a completely participatory experience. So this is all placeholder, obviously, but when you're actually inside of the galleries itself, you'll be able to swipe between all these different artifacts and then actually replicate the pose, one to the next. So it's able to sort of rate you, though it's not really about getting the right answer per se. But again, you put that pose into your own body and you start to understand what the sculpture, or at least another way of understanding what that sculpture is actually communicating. And then you can look at other visitors, and you can share them, and you can compare them, and there's ways in which it's social. But it, it's a whole different way of thinking experientially, really about learning. There's another piece uh, from the same group about how a sculpture comes alive. The first thing it does, I, I love this, it takes the Hanawa on the left, which is from the third century in Japan, it just puts into the context. right? It's one something that's impossible to imagine in a modern art museum. Just show me where this thing is actually from, how it made sense at that point. 
And then it takes you into a gallery where you can actually make a sculpture using the same techniques. Uh, so use a Microsoft Connect, it takes a picture of you and you and your friend, uh, and then you can sculpt it using the exact same techniques. So with different swipe gestures, it essentially allows you to mold and to shape these different objects one to the next. It shows you different films. I mean, it brings you into a direct relationship with making, which is obviously, I don't know, to anyone who's made artwork, when you go to an art museum, it's all about making. But something about the conventions with an art museum really drain that process of actually creating things out of it. And so this just lets you, through something very simple, you know, it's made for everybody, but allows you to get in touch with this idea of being able to move through the actual steps within making an artwork itself. So the last piece from this group is about storytelling, and, and this is just a, a wireframe, but there's these series of tapestries um, that tell the story of Perseus. And so I was really interested in the sort of uh, hero with a thousand faces idea, these, these myths that get told and retold over and over again. Uh, so we have this piece, which actually takes you through Perseus, and then through all the different parts of popular culture that Perseus has been told and retold over and over again, and then allows you to actually take and essentially remix the tapestry that's in front of you, right? So you can choose these different formats. In this case, you might choose a comic book. Uh, and then you can actually use it to actually make your own comic book, to put together your own uh, dialogue, and then you can actually send it off to all your friends. You can make a film, your own film about Perseus, and actually remix that myth using the assets within the museum itself. Uh, context. In this piece, this is a, a grouping of artifacts that are all from the 1930s. And again, that white cube just divorces all these objects from the relevance in the time. So we have, it's just a simple short film, but essentially goes through all of the different contexts for the actual objects themselves. Just using all of these simple quotes from the actual artists. Because you see these artifacts, and they clearly are from a time, and they have a relationship. But the fact that you're in Cleveland, that you have architecture, that you have urban design, that you have experience, and you have history, all are actually baked into those objects themselves, but you wouldn't know it from them just sitting sort of mutely on their white pedestals. This quote, I think, is super interesting, uh, just thinking about how political work is now. So I'm going to go on to the next artifact, uh, next interface, which we call the collections wall. So this is a, a huge 40-foot interface that sits at the end of those galleries, which are called Gallery 1. And essentially, it's a way to look at the entire collection all at one time. So this is a, just a design. I'll, I'll sort of zoom in if you want to see it. But this is everything in the collection that's on display at that moment. And I'll go into it a little bit more and allow uh, us to investigate what's actually on these pieces. But it, uh, some of these visualizations are timelines. Uh, some are sort of thematic back and forth. Uh, this is showing dance and music, uh, which is super interesting when you think about that actually reflected over time. Right, the ways in which human culture has been producing these themes over and over again. And actually, when you get into modernism, the works themselves, like Picasso, are totally cubist and actually pretty much uh, embody the idea. Here are portraits, and they're meant to be shown all at eye level and at full human scale. Again, giving that sort of shock of the familiar moment where you're like, oh, right. These are people. These are all people. And I'm starting to see how different people in different eras even thought about people. And that's a very, very simple move within the type of pyrotechnics of data viz that we're capable of, but that alone gives you that, that, again, that shock of the familiar. This idea of just doing something simply by size, allowing you to see all these pieces put together, one to the next. And then the last, I mean, this is both kind of obvious and I think you know, arguably one of the most satisfying, just doing this huge kaleidoscopic work all arranged by color itself. Now, just to go into the interaction, because the piece itself is obviously a data viz from far away, uh, but when you go up close, you can actually click on any of those individual pieces and swipe through it. What's interesting, too, is it's really made to essentially be the sort of digital rabbit hole that you can fall into. Every work is related to another work. Every related work has a tour attached to it or a video ass attached to it. It's really made to sort of be a visually curious machine that drags you deeper and deeper and deeper. And actually what happens is that you can grab any of those individual pieces and drag it onto an iPad below. And groups of people can use it. It's, it's scalable for however many people can end up in there. And so what you're doing when you're grabbing it down on the iPad is essentially making a custom tour of the museum itself. 
And so here's the iPad experience. Again, like all the other interfaces, they're meant to be completely opt-in. So you can get this information using an iPad. You don't have to. That's completely fine. It's using, uh, there's a long conversation about augmented reality, and I said I would show some AR today. So it's actually using image recognition uh, to allow curators to point out very, very specific locations on the artworks themselves. This is just placeholder content, but you can see how fast the algorithms are. And to me, this is AR done right. This is something you can't do in any other way. Right? And it actually is based on the thing that you're looking at. It's enhancing. It is truly a lens into what you're looking at. I will say, again, on the, the concept of fear, we don't actually know how this will work. We've done user testing. People like it. They say they like it. But I don't know. So we actually have a whole other system that will allow people to get the same information near you now. We have uh, Wi-Fi triangulation down to three meters. So it allows any visitor in a gallery to say, well, just tell me what's around me. And that's a lot of how we're working these days, is with cutting edge redundancy. Another big piece of it is that it allows people to save their favorites. So that capacity to go through the museum and essentially author your own personal take on the museum is a huge aspect of it. And you know what's amazing is that a lot of this work was driven by the institution itself. I mean, I have to give total hats off to the education department and the technology department at CMA, which we built all of this work in partnership with, because they were constantly pushing us and saying, you know, where's the visitor inside of this? Cleveland has this amazing condition where they have all of these, you know, what you would call essentially power users, people who love this institution are there all the time. And this was made really for them to be able to communicate and author their own tours. So the last piece I'm going to show from this uh, sequence is an uh, original concept that we had where people would essentially draw it's actually not on the screen. Well, there's some of it. Uh, and it would connect you by the visuals of what you're drawing with pieces of art from the collection. It's sort of like the face recognition piece. And so as we were developing it, uh, we had the great fortune that Zach Lieberman took us up on the offer to, to work on this. He improved it mightily. I'm just going to show a short film. And I know he's going to talk about it with, during his talk. But this is an early version that he was showing. It's, it's improved more. But essentially, you're just drawing and connecting. The amazing thing was we actually made that interface for the children's gallery, and it was so hilariously addictive, both for the curators and the visitors. We now have a version of it in the adult galleries, which is a little more themed back and forth. Uh, but people were essentially using it constantly back and forth. So the last piece that I'm going to show, I am hoping, will reveal the truth about where ideas come from. And, and the reason I phrase it this way uh, and we have a couple of best practices that try and help us. Again, this idea that there's this huge gap between the ideas that you're creating and that process of sort of falling in love with these new ideas and then getting it all the way down the road into the final pieces that I showed at the beginning. And so there's a couple of rules of thumb uh, that we've developed uh, to help us sort of think about these things. The first is to work with people or groups who inspire you. It seems self-obvious, but it's actually really hard to do uh, and really important. We have uh, a lot of incredible people at local projects are actually looking for more incredible people, and that was my shameless plug that my studio director made me do. But uh, what we're trying to do is really gather together a lot of different types of people who are interested in other disciplines. So we have coders sitting next to filmmakers, sitting next to graphic designers, sitting next to sound designers, and we encourage all these different disciplines to actually step on each other's toes and have opinions about each other's works and to collaborate actively together. Second piece is to actually think about moving actively from the probable to the plausible to the possible. Right? And essentially what that means is, is give yourself permission to actually go out on a limb to embrace the fear from the beginning that what you're pitching is over the top or maybe crazy, but that you'll get there, that there's a process to actualizing uh, the early conceptual dream. You have to protect it as you move it through the steps to actualization and production. Uh, but that's really, really important, that permission. And for me, that permission comes from this third idea. Uh, this is like a weird trick that happened to me. How many people here uh, have bosses? Let me just see the line, right? OK. And how many people here often find themselves thinking about their boss like, you know, if I was in charge, you know what I would do? And then you have this, yeah, so let's see the hands. How many people feel like that all the time? OK, so I, I worked for an incredible studio uh, and developed all this interior architecture for Museum of Natural History and projects in Brazil. This place, Ralph Applebaum Associates, it's world famous. I was there for seven years. It was an amazing ride. But I found myself in that position over and over again, thinking, 
you know, if I was in charge, you know what I would do? And then I got senior enough that I could pitch my crazy ideas, and people were like, man, eh, that's like not for us, basically. And then I started my own firm. And you know what's hilarious is I still do that. I still, even on the projects that I'm in charge of, I think, yeah, what would I do if I, I was in charge? Like, right, this, this, what if, this thought experiment about not having all the responsibilities and all the constraints and all the requirements and all the things that you know have to get done, just take, your, take yourself out of that loop and fantasize for a moment just about how it should be done. So if you feel yourself ever saying things like, you know it would be really crazy, right? That's the moment that you want to start building on. And you do it by working with people who inspire you and giving yourself permission. So in this project, I can't actually show you the true project because uh, this is a pitch deck that I'm going to share. One of the ideas actually is going into production, uh, which is all NDA and locked up. Uh, but these are the earliest ideas, and you'll get a sense of how we start. So the client had a space sort of like this. It was a little bit wider, but a beautiful, bright, super sunny space. It's a large corporation. They have a creative studio within the corporation. And the brief was really simple. They said, what we'd like you to do is to think about making some type of data visualization in this space, right? which is a huge challenge for anyone working with technology, because bright sun is the enemy of all projections and monitors, et cetera. So it was very clear from the beginning that we were going to be working physically. So I'm just going to show two of the crazier ideas, more beloved ideas. And it's really rare to show these sort of unmade or maybe even unmakeable ideas in these uh, circumstances, but I really want to think about this, sort of like releasing these ideas to the wild. And if anybody here wants to take up these ideas and run with them and make them, that would be awesome. I'd love to talk to you about that, et cetera. Uh, so the first one we called City of Data. And the way that it worked was we started thinking about all of these different ways in which people connect with each other, right? You have all this data, et cetera, and we started thinking about how it could be physicalized. And in some ways, it's just a graphic trick. You go from here to here, right? And then you go into here, and you think about these things as sort of physical modular building blocks, and really inspired by architecture and the ways in which architecture has the capacity to take lots of small multiples and sort of stack them one on top of the next. We found this project in China by uh, MVRDV. It's an amazing project, this huge, massive sculpture itself. And we thought, well, what if those objects actually meant something, were actually parts of DataViz itself? Well, that's interesting. And how would you actually, you know, actually move and sort of assemble these things in some type of dynamic visualization? Well, we got interested in this, right? Like, what if we put a robot arm inside of your studio? And this is literally how we pitched it to the client. We're like, what if we had a robot arm? It actually was moving all these different modular systems around. You know, you think about the Eames, and you think about their house of cards. And then we thought, well, why does it have to be the same type of modular pieces? You know, information's dynamic, and everything that this studio is producing is totally dynamic. So what if we put, like, a 3D printer in the middle of that, right? So you have a robot arm, and you have a 3D printer, and it's able to actually make dynamic icons for everything that's happening at that moment. So maybe there's icons that are chosen for different members of the studio. Uh, you can't see, but there's a person over there who's getting a, a live 3D scan. So what if there's, like, a 3D scanner and visitors? They have a lot of very prominent visitors come, and they could actually be part of this physical sculpture on the spot. The 3D printer would sort of print them out, and then the robot arm would actually put, take that icon and put it onto the wall. And, of course, that leads you to this question, like, right, you go from there to there, and then the 3D printer is still printing stuff, and the arm is still moving stuff, and the collection gets more and more sort of overwhelming, more interesting, but the printer keeps printing, and the robot arm keeps moving, and then you have, like, all of this, and it's, like, building over and over again, and more and more. And then you have, finally, their office is like a, some horrible episode of Hoarders, where you have, like, all this stuff on one to the next, right? So not surprisingly, they didn't choose that idea. And, and actually, I have to be honest, like that last stuff I actually built in for you all, because it's fun to imagine this sort of gray goo uh, solution to data viz filling up their entire installation, uh, right? And so then the, the last idea I'll show is uh, called Sunrider. This actually inspired the entire name for the project, which was called Codename Firestarter, and you'll understand that in a second. So uh, we're really inspired by uh, Shimon Ati. I don't know if you know his work, but he did a lot of work inscribing uh, different memory quotes. On the Lower East Side, he's worked in Berlin uh, through lasers and other devices, just handwriting directly onto the wall. And this is a work by Anne Hamilton where she was filling up huge uh, swaths of architecture, all with these handwritten notes, one to the next. And so we started thinking, well, you know, but you have this sunlit space, so how can we actually inscribe things into a sunlit space? Uh, and again, we were in sort of like the, well, let's, let's see what this client will actually tolerate. Let's see where they'll go. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be crazy if we could actually use the sun as the actual pen itself, as it were? 
right? Like, what if we could actually refine and actually hone the sun in a way and actually magnify into the individual piece of architecture? Maybe we can inscribe it. It gives this kind of incredible permanence to the works themselves. Right, and so we went from there, and then we found this incredible project from Google. This is like this crazy lens. And I love, like, only Google people in their spare time will, like, don goggles and fry eggs. Right? It's totally amazing. Uh, and so we got actually really excited, because clearly it can be done, because Google did it. And we started thinking about these gunpowder drawings of Kai Gua Kang, where he was actually inscribing these things into architecture itself. And we started thinking, well, that, that would be something really exciting for all of us. Right? Also, not surprisingly, they did not choose this one. <laughs> so I can't show you the one they chose. It's coming down the pike. It's very exciting. Uh, but I really want to encourage all of us, as we're thinking about these endless, successive waves of innovation crashing one on the next, uh, to really consider our place within that world. It's actually a, a really privileged moment, I think, for creativity. There's a lot of fear out there from publishers, from musicians, from powers that be, from libraries, from archives, from governments, all about this massive disruption. But we actually are on the front lines, right? And as these waves are successfully crashing one to the next, we have the privilege of actually assimilating and synthesizing. Really, I think of it like metabolizing this information one to the next. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jer and Dave for, for having all of us here because it's this incredible opportunity, right? All of us are gathered here to be able to make sense of all this. Yeah, seriously. You know, in, in the midst of talking about this, talk to a friend, uh, I was talking to the metaphor and the age of discovery, he said, you know, there's kind of a hole in your thinking because the actual age of discovery, there were a ton of people who did not make it back. <laughs> right? I was like, oh, right, right. And then I thought, well, that's actually kind of right. Meaning, of these experiments that we're launching, so many of them are apt to be complete and utter failures, right? All these ideas that we cook up, they're great, they're wonderful, right in the trash can of the equivalent. And that's really, to a certain extent, the privileged position that we're in. We get a chance to think up those ideas, pitch them, win in them, drive them forward for all of us. And that, my friends, is the truth about our moment. Thank you very much.